Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to another all-new edition of geek to me Radio. Today we are joined for the whole hour by actor extraordinaire Eric Braden. You know him as Victor Newman on Young and the Restless, as well as many of his other countless TV and film roles. We'll be talking to him for the whole hour, so stand by. We've got a huge show. We actually went over. I had to cut stuff out to try to make this fit within the time frame we keep. So let's get right to it. We're joined now by an extraordinary actor who's truly lived an extraordinary life. I was fortunate enough to read a copy of his book, I'll Be Damned, which you can still get. We'll put the Amazon link up. We're joined now by Eric Braden. How are you, sir? How are you doing, James? I just want to start out by saying I loved the book. I could not put it down. Sometimes I get a biography. I've got a couple of them I'm, I'm trying to get through now. And it'll usually, for a book, take me about three weeks to get through one. I blew through yours, I think, in a matter of four days. I could not put it down. Every time I'd go to work, I'd come home from my day job. I couldn't wait to put it down at, or, or get home, I should say, and pick it back up and start reading it. Well, I'm glad to hear that. That's nice. I appreciate that. So talking about the idea for your memoirs, uh, where did the idea of doing, because you've lived such a fascinating life, obviously someone must have said, hey, let's put this down, or was it something that ruminated in your head that we should uh, get it on paper, record it as it were, and uh, make a book out of it? Where did the idea for the memoirs come from? Mm, never with me, to be honest with you. I um, was asked to do it by uh, some friends. And um, Lindsay Harrison, who uh, had done Jeannie Cooper's bio, approached me one time and said, "You know, it'll be it'll be painless." I said, "If you say so, um, let's go for it." That's how it happened. To be honest with you, I had no, I, I didn't even know where to start. You know what I'm saying? It must be very gratifying to have this book be so well received. As I said, I've loved it. I know a lot of people who have, uh, when I first put out there that I'd be speaking with you. A lot of people said, I read the book. I loved it, too. It was great. Uh, a lot of positive response. It must make you feel very, very good. It is indeed, and, and I'm very grateful for it. So uh, I was um, kind of surprised, and, um, and the process was not that difficult, really. Uh, she's a damn good writer, and uh, there you are. And with the success you had in screen and on uh, television and film, and you've even done uh, some stage work uh, all the, back in the beginning of your career, as you're doing your 40th year on Young and the Restless, congratulations, by the way, it's a, that's incredible. Thank you. To be, Thank uh, to you. It's, at, it's, it's unimaginable, but yeah, it's it'll, be, it'll be that 40 years in next year, early next year, February, I think. That's uh, that, uh, that's got to be, if not the record, one of the records for playing the same character throughout that entire time. That's uh, that's truly remarkable. It must be, I guess, a credit to both the writers and the people who work on the show, but also to your uh, your craft that you've uh, been able to keep this character fresh and new for forty years. It is really, really the result of of the writing of Bill Bell, and who created that character, who created all the major characters on the show. And um, um, some new writers always try to veer away from that, but it, it's it's the blueprint of the show, and you do that at your own peril. So, um, but it is Bill's idea, his creation of that character, uh, with some input on my part, 
uh, I was sick and tired of just playing a bad guy, so we gave Victor Newman the background that um, uh, made him far more interesting. Uh, no one is just bad. Um, perhaps there are some people who are genetically just bad. <laughs> but generally speaking, there's a, a traumatic experience in, in, in the past or a series of experiences or circumstances that lead someone to become who they are. And uh, the moment he wrote that, and namely that Victor had been left in an orphanage when he was a young boy and been essentially abandoned by his parents, uh, and that explains a lot of things. And once he wrote that, I said, now I'll stay. Because now the character is, is far more well-rounded than, than he had been before. So uh, I have to thank, uh, thank Bill Bell for that. And when you look back, as we talked about your uh, career, stage, film, TV, uh, thinking about where you started in Germany as a boy post-World War II, mm-hmm. looking back at where you are now, if you had the chance to change anything that you could change, is there anything you'd do differently? Because you, you've got a fantastic life. Uh, you started uh, just – people have to read the book. I'll be damned. You can still buy it. Uh, I'll put a link up to Amazon on our website and on our Twitter feed. But uh, concerning where you started, is there anything you would go back and change knowing everything you know now? That's a very good question. Um, mm, no, I, I wish one had been in the position to change the circumstances in which I grew up. And uh, um, I wish I hadn't been so foolish to have four brain concussions between the age of nine and 12, <laughs> all through various sports. But I mean, you know, this is, this is what happens. Yeah. And um, it can happen. There's nothing we can change about that. I personally, um, I'm not someone who lives with regrets, to be honest with you. Um, not really. Um, no, not really. One wishes one hadn't hurt some people. Uh, that one obviously has. We all have, one way or the other. But um, that's part of life as well. And um, no, I, I can't say that it was perfect. Of course not. But I'm not someone who uh, lives with the regrets. I, I really am not. Uh, do I think about things? Yes. Do I think um, I could have been different here and there? Yes. Um, do I wish I'd finished school? Yes. Um, mm, but do I regret, really regret things? No. There were always explanations for certain things happening in my life, and uh, I accept that. You know, I've been blessed. And uh, been genetically blessed with, with um, pretty damn good health and strength and uh, um, love sports, and that has stayed with me. Uh, all my life, and the discipline to work out has stayed with me all my life. Um, sports really saved my ass, you know, psychologically and physically many times. And um, I, I would say um, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the discipline that was instilled in me early on uh, about working out. I, I, I venture to say that most psychiatrists' couches would be empty <laughs> if um, if people learn how to work out because it creates dopamine in the brain and uh, creates feel-good hormones and, and uh, it relaxes you and it is something as simple as walking. And it, it does wonders and is, it is so obvious that a lot of people forget about it, but it really, it really works. And I would say um, I am, like anyone else is, um, very often stressed about this or that. And the only thing that relieves my stress is working out. You know, I fortunately have never learned to go to drugs or whatever. Um, that will interest me. And uh, working out is the best medicine there is. Do I always feel like it? No. Do I have my, to talk myself into it in the mornings or afternoons, whenever, or at night when I come home? They say if I'm work, I come home late. I will work out as late as ten, if need be, hmm. and I do something all the time. So um, there you are. That has been, I would say, almost my most saving grace. Yeah, and um, yeah. And you touch on that many times in the book. Sports comes up so often uh, in in the story of your life. You've uh, grown up playing it. 
uh, when you were in Germany, you uh, just such an outdoorsman, such a sports guy. Did the the river story when you were in Montana was ridiculously exciting, and then you got on to coach your son's team too. So you uh, sports literally has never been not a part of your life. No, it's always been part of my life, and and you know I coached him in soccer after I won the U.S. championship in 1973 with a team called the Maccabees, and we won the U.S. Open Cup. In fact, the team won it five times, and uh, um, and I, after that, coached my son for about 25 years. And um, he and I are very close, and I also took him to the to the um, ghetto gyms in L.A., 78th and Hoover, which doesn't exist anymore, and 108th and Broadway was a fabled um, boxing gym, and I wanted him to you know, learn it the hard way. And uh, he did. And he has profited from that, I think. Um, he and I are very close. So uh, to sometimes to the chagrin of my wife, <laughs> who wishes we had had a daughter as well, you know, because he and I would talk politics and sports. So um, uh, she got a little short-changed. Um, I wish we also had a daughter, I think, for her sake. And with, uh, you mentioned the, the championship from soccer, 72 and 73, uh, you've uh, right. been such a, a huge outdoors person, a sports person, and then having those championships, but also uh, getting the Daytime Best Actor Award, but mm. also not just that, the humanitarian things you've gotten awards for, humanitarian award uh, from the government of mm. Israel, uh, twice mm. given the Federal Medal of Honor from the President of Germany, it, mm. it's it's almost unfathomable to the normal person that you've excelled so well in so many different areas. I feel like a slacker now. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, um, I've been very lucky. So, uh, I'm full of piss and vinegar and, and always was, and a lot of things bothered me and I tried to improve a lot of things. You know, it's always wanting to improve things and wanting to improve uh, relationships and and uh, essentially wanting to improve the understanding also between peoples, not only between people but between nations as well, as much as one can. Mm -hmm. And uh, what always bothered me, obviously, was the legacy of the Second World War. It bothered me terribly, and bothered any German of my generation or subsequent generation. So it's almost, um, you know, Sisyphean task, but it is it is it is was worth it and. Uh, I wanted to create uh, a dialogue between Germans and Jews, for example, and that's why I created the German-American Cultural Society. And I also wanted to talk about the enormous contributions of Germans to America. It's the largest ethnic group in America, and that is unbeknownst to a lot of people. So the contributions of German immigrants to this country uh, have been substantial. And I didn't want to just talk about those 12 years and the the vicious excesses of those 12 years, I wanted something positive to come from across the pond about Germany, you know? Absolutely. And yeah. I think uh, politics today, normally on my show I don't talk politics, but it's kind of hard sometimes to separate the entertainment world from politics because they are kind of intertwined, especially these of days. Of course they are. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's politics affect our lives, right. period. And it's, it's one of those things where I notice in your book you have several occasions where as I said, especially nowadays, it's hard to talk politics because people uh, react very emotionally, and rightly so, depending on the, what you're bringing up and talking about. But you seem like you're very interested in an actual discourse and not shouting your opinion like people on both sides of the aisle tend to do. We're seeing it a lot. Uh, I think that's key, and I don't know how to explain that to people. What do you? How do you find the best way? Do, do you have people who just can't discuss politics with you, even though you're so level-headed about it and reasonable? We're going to come back finding out how Eric Braden is able to talk politics with people calmly in today's climate. We'll be right back. Stand by. Hi, this is James Enstall, host of Geek Me Radio, and in honor of my favorite Themyserian, I've decided to become an Amazon warrior. Harrod, give me strength. The next time you want to buy something from Amazon, go to geektomeradio.com first and click on our Amazon affiliate link. Simply shop like you normally would, and when you check out, a small percentage will go towards supporting the show. So remember, the next time you want to search Amazon for the latest Wonder Woman graphic novel or parts for your invisible jet, 
Click through from geek2meradio.com first. The world was in peril. Would you have me stand by and do nothing? Hi, this is John Delancey, and you're listening to geek to me Radio. And we're back. This segment brought to you by discoverstcharles.com. Discover St. Charles. Boy. Second weekend of Christmas traditions in the books. If you have not yet been to St. Charles, uh, if you've not been there ever, this is a great time to go. There's not a bad time to go, but Christmas is a really good time to go. They've got it all decked out for the holidays with lights all over, candlelit late night shopping on Wednesdays and Friday nights, uh, Crumpest Carnival going every Wednesday and Friday night all the way through the end of December. And on Saturdays and Sundays, they have their big Santa parade with international Santas from around the globe, various gift givers, living history characters who, with whom you can interact. Uh, it's a great time. They actually have chestnuts roasting over an open fire you can buy. If you've not had a chestnut, it tastes like a potato. Uh, it's very good. If you have not tried one before, it's one of those Victorian traditions. Give it a shot. Lots of things to do. Lots of unique shopping opportunities up and down the street, and plenty of great food. If you're a foodie, if you're a history buff, if you're looking for that perfect gift for somebody, you need to come to to St. Charles to check out what there is for you there in the shops along North and South Main Street. Uh, Go to the website to get more information, discoverstcharles.com. That's discoverstcharles.com. Get all the information right there on their tab. If you're uh, not able to make it during Christmas, plenty of other opportunities. You can plan your trip now. Look at the places there are to stay while you're coming in from out of town. If you are from the greater St. Louis area, then you've really got no excuse. Head on over. Check it out. It goes all the way through Christmas Eve is the last day of the festival. And uh, if you can't make it for Christmas, come out and see it in the new year. Make it a New Year's resolution to come visit St. Charles. Plan your trip. DiscoverSTCharles.com. We are joined this entire hour by Eric Braden. Before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about uh, how it is to broach politics with someone in today's climate as politically charged as things are and how to talk rationally with people about politics. You know, you you need to, um, if that is even possible in today's climate, I always um, hope it is possible, to sit down and say, look, we like each other as human beings. Now let's talk what divides us politically. What is the reason for your opinions? I give the reason for mine. And then let us, because we live in a democracy, agree to disagree, if, if need be. Or can I convince you? Or can you convince me? It's, it's you know, I, I also hate labels. I hate left and right. I, I can't stand them. It's, let's look at a problem objectively. You know, is, is there, is there uh, climate change? Yeah. According to 99% of all scientists. So why deny that? Why? It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, our regulations, uh, have they helped clean the air? You bet. I know you're in L.A. You know, when I came here in the 60s and we worked out, I played competitive soccer. Sometimes we had to stop because we couldn't breathe. Hmm. So have regulations helped? Yes. What's there to argue about that? I don't get it. Right. You understand? Yeah. In other words, these are facts. So it's it's it's. Bull- to, to argue otherwise. Uh, so, so there are some things I, I just don't understand, and especially if they are simply argued along ideological lines. And nothing with ideology it has to do with fact. Mm-hmm. And the fact is that when we regulated uh, tailpipe emissions, the air became better, period. That's it. Right. Okay, you can see it visually in L.A., wake up in the mornings. In the old days, you, could, you couldn't see for a mile. It was that thick. Now it is better. Can it be improved? Yes, absolutely. Should you undo those regulations? No, you're nuts if you do. That's all. Yeah. You're just crazy. That's as simple as it is. There's no argument. So uh, do we need clean waters? Yeah. Do we have scientific evidence that dirty water here and there contributes to the, to the uh, diseases or sickness or uh, unwell-being of, of a lot of kids and a lot of people? Yes, we do. Let's look at it scientifically. Science, to me, is, if we have learned anything, for heaven's sake, unless you want to go back to the dark ages, <laughs> but if, if there's one standard I want to believe in, it's science. Prove it to me. Right. Anyway. You're talking to someone from Missouri. We're from the show me state. So that's, I, I agree with science. Uh, you show me the facts. They can't be disputed. Please. <laughs> I mean, simple as it is. 
to know. I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the, the healthcare system. It's very complicated. It is. But do we need to change some of it to make it more equitable and to make it uh, so that a lot of people don't go broke because of their medical bills? Something wrong with that. What is there not to understand about that? Mm -hmm. Then you, of course, deal also with a lot of people who don't know that on the ground when they argue certain points. <laughs> I'm going to have to do so much editing no. on this. <laughs> That's no, you don't do that. editing on it. What the hell? No. Kidding? No, it, well, the radio show, so some, some of the words I'll have to edit out, but it'll be, I'll beep over them. It'll be great. It's fine. I, I speak my mind, That's, my friend. I speak my mind. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay. That's fine. As passionate as you are about politics, and we mentioned the awards you've gotten in your life, you've done so much to advance the cause of German-American relations, and you're such an outspoken person. Do you, do you look back at some of the younger generation today, and from myself and even younger, and think that there's more they could be doing? Are certain people doing what they can do? Where do you think people need to ex excel more? Because like I said, I almost feel like an underachiever with all that you've got under your belt. You need to read history and have it taught in school. Don't take that away. It's vitally important to have a perspective. You know, I mean, I mean, before uh, the Steve Bannons and the, the Steve Miller's characters of this world start talking about America becoming isolationist and it's bullshit. America, America is the leading nation in the world, and the world wants it to be that. What, do you want China to be the leading nation? Do you want Russia to be the leading nation? This is nonsense. Europe is uh, not cohesive enough to do that. America is the one that everyone looks up to. We all, in, in European democracies, owe their existence to the United States of America. Mm. Period. Germany owes its reunification. Germany owes its existence as a democracy to the USA. Okay, that's historically simply indisputable. So it's ridiculous. The, the Trans-Pacific trade deal that we had made mm. under Obama is very important for us, for America, because that way we maintain hegemony in that part of the world. What, we, we withdraw from all that and allow the Chinese to come in? What are you talking about? If China were a democracy, different story. It's not. We have good values to, to convey to people in the world. And the world is looking up to America. Have we made mistakes in our foreign policy? Sure, here and there. But on the whole, America and our nuclear armament is responsible for the peace having been maintained for the last 70 years. Without Russia and America having nuclear arms to the point where we could destroy the world many times over, we would have had another cataclysmic war between Russia and America a long time ago. So when you talk about disarmament, I'm not for complete disarmament. The only thing that assures peace is what is called MAD, mutually assured destruction. Right. That is what ensures peace. Do we have too many nuclear weapons? Yes. Should we reduce them? Yes. But eliminate them? No. Makes no sense. Since we're getting anyway. into politics, normally, normally I don't, but since we're getting into politics, who, who do you like in the upcoming election as uh, the Democratic field? Uh, in the Democratic field, to be very honest with you, uh, I want Joe Biden. Okay. You know, I want Joe Biden because Joe is basically a decent man. I just want a decent man, that's all. Someone who understands, who has been there, who understands America's many ties to, to other parts of the world, who understands all of our international treaties, etc., etc. You know, I don't want anyone dramatic. Forget that. We don't need drama. We need calm now. Just calm. Slow down and remind America and Americans that we are the foundation of the United Nations. We are the foundations of the International Monetary Fund. We are the foundation of NATO, etc. We are the foundation of a lot of very good international organizations. Let's remind ourselves of that, okay? Perfect. And uh, like I said, I normally don't talk politics, but uh, you're such a passionate person about politics that I don't think we could have done the interview and not at least touched on it. So that, that, was, right. that was perfect. <laughs> okay. If we circle back a little bit to your career with all the different movies and films, you've done so many staples of television that I, even as old as I am, I would love to go back and watch some of these that I would sneak up and uh, watch turn on the TV for like Kolchak Night Stalker or Gunsmoke. Uh, I was a huge fan of Mannix, even though it was, you know, obviously in syndication by the time I got around to watching it. When you look back, is there a TV show with all the ones you've done that you kind of didn't get to do it's like oh i would have loved to do an episode of three's company or anything like that no no, no not really the, the, uh, i mean seinfeld i would have loved to have done that seinfeld is hilarious i think it's it's it's, it's a great no i was very happy yes seinfeld i would have loved to have done i was very happy to do gunsmoke i loved it i did five or six of them and uh, it was a wonderful company 
very professionally run. I, I, I love doing it. And I love doing the Mary Tyler Moore show, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, we just had Ed Asner on a couple weeks ago uh, before his 90th birthday, him talking about that show. That's one my dad and I, when he was still around, we used to sit down and watch that all the time, and that was my, one of my introductions to TV. That's right. So I enjoy doing that and, uh, and Gunsmoke. And um, here and there, a few others. But on the whole, I was very happy having done those two. And I know you mentioned in the book, too, that you're such a Seinfeld fan. So I, I got to ask, what's your favorite Seinfeld episode? And I knew from reading his book, he's a Seinfeld fan. So we had to find out what is Eric Braden's favorite Seinfeld episode. We'll get that information and more right after this break. Stand by. Hi, I'm Ken Trotter. I was the voice of the Green Arrow in the Justice League Unlimited. I play Scotty Baldwin on General Hospital. So when you're not watching General Hospital, listen to Geek to Me Radio. We're back. Talking this whole hour with actor Eric Braden. From reading his book, I'll Be Damned, I knew he was a Seinfeld fan. And it came around, we were talking about Seinfeld, so of course I had to ask, what's your very favorite Seinfeld episode? There's one, where <laughs> an Orthodox Latvian priest tells Cosmo Kramer, "You got the Kavorka, yes, the, <laughs> the lure of the animal." It is absolutely hilarious. That is a classic. <laughs> and in order to drive that out of himself, uh, the priest suggests that he wear a lot of garlic around his neck and and vinegar. It, it is absolutely priceless. There are so many priceless segments. It's it's the other one is where Newman, where Newman uh, takes Cosmo Kramer to court, you know, to fight a ticket. Right. And he and White he wants whale. he wants Kramer to corroborate the fact that Newman was, you know, close to suicide, and or that that he, uh, Cosmo Kramer was to etc. It is hilarious. It's it's a priceless show. I, I wish I'd done that, and I wish I'd done the half hour comedy. I would have loved it, to be honest with you. I think my, my favorite episode is probably the one where Kramer gets the Merv Griffin set inside his apartment and has Jerry <laughs> George in it. It's hysterical. He cannot moves him down so when someone else comes in the apartment. It's, it's great. Uh, Michael Richards is one of my, one of my all-time favorite entertainers and actors. It, 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 it's priceless. And so is she, by the way. I, I love her. Oh, uh, Julie Louis-Dreyfus, uh, yeah. Yes, wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And so damn charming. She's wonderful. So do you have a lot of, I mean, it seems like between your humanitarian efforts, obviously you're working out regularly, uh, you're very busy with Young and the Restless. When, what do you do? Do you uh, take time to watch movies? Do you watch TV? Uh, do you, what do you do when you're in your downtime? You know, um, I read a lot. I try to, in the morning at breakfast, I always read the New York Times, Washington Post, um, BBC, uh, whatever. Uh, I just, I, I read voraciously. I uh, love to keep informed. There's so much to keep informed about. My God almighty, there's so <laughs> much interesting stuff. You know, it's never enough. And then um, I watch um, CNN a lot. I watch um, certainly 60 Minutes every Sunday. Um, let's see. I used to watch Anthony Bourdain. I think he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I watch Rick Steves. On PBS, I watch I watch some Netflix documentaries. Absolutely fantastic documentary about the Roosevelts, Theodore and Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt. That's, that's actually fantastic. in my queue. I haven't had a chance to see it, but that's in my queue. You Netflix. have got you've you've got to do it because it it teaches you so much about that part of American history and an extraordinarily important part of American history. And that's why I'm saying uh, history is so very important. And we must teach it. People must learn about it. Yeah, when I went to college at Westminster University, uh, one of my majors was political science. Where did you go? Where did you go? Westminster College in, in Fulton, Missouri. It's where Winston Churchill gave the Iron Curtain speech. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I went there, and one of one of my majors was political science. And mm -hmm. I, I had a fascinating class. A professor taught a World War II history class, and we had it in the basement of the Churchill Memorial that was there. And wow. It was absolutely fascinating. Tro don't shortchange people on, on history, do you? You must not do that. Uh, it is vitally important to understanding what the hell is going on, you know? Exactly, yeah. You talked about history, obviously. You were in one of my very favorite movies because I'm a Titanic-obsessed maniac. I actually have an original copy of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch from the day that it sank that was my grandmother's. Um, but to see you pop up in that was a, a real treat. And you talk about it in your book that you almost didn't want to do that role. No, 
I didn't. It, it just wasn't um, wasn't enough, you know. It, it just it just wasn't enough. And and uh, obviously, I'm very glad I did, and I'm very glad I worked with James Cameron, who happened to be couldn't have been nicer uh, with me, and he was a fan of the movie Colossus that I had done in 1968 or 69, I think I forget now. And uh, so it, it was quite an experience. And um, in retrospect, I'm glad I did it. Uh, I was one of the few people who, while we were shooting it, said that this would make a lot of money. And people ask me why. I said because it's an expensive soap opera. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I know how, how successful soap operas were and all. You know, and just the painstaking attention to detail that James Cameron took. Like, there's the scene when. Uh... Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character jumps up on the railing for the first class and there's a man sitting there with his son spinning a top and that's literally off a, a picture that someone took as they were leaving Cherbourg, that, the port there in France. Uh, so just the painstaking attention to detail he put into that movie was just phenomenal. He's a genius. Uh, James Cameron is, is truly a genius. I don't say that lightly, but he really is. He is um, I was very, very, very impressed. And he, he knew more about every aspect of movie making and there are quite a few aspects to it uh, than any other camera people or sound people or whatever. He, he was way ahead of them. They told me, and uh, they had the greatest respect for him. And you've mentioned in the book, too, that uh, you weren't going to take that role, but then your wife, Dale, and uh, your son, Christian, kind of encouraged you to, to take it. They both talked me into it, because they are film buffs, and, and I'm not, and uh, uh, they both said, you must work with James Cameron, and... Uh, only upon that encouragement did I do it. I, I was not about to do it. <laughs> the, the names of the actors you've worked with throughout your career is just incredible. Mm. Um, you worked with one of my favorite Bond villains, Kurt Jurgens, who was uh, in The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, but yep. He had a great career. But you you were almost James Bond, if I'm not mistaken, if uh, reading yep. your memoirs. That's, uh, talk a little bit about that, if you could. Well, uh, I had done, as you alluded to before, a film called Colossus at Universal Studios in 1969, I think, in which I starred. And um, the Cabby Broccoli, one of the producers of James Bond, had seen that and had called my agency. And he wanted to talk to me, and we had lunch. And uh, a lot of people have always thought that I was from Britain, and I learned British English in school. So we sat down for lunch, and he says, do you still have a British passport? I said, no, I have a German passport. And it went down like a curtain, you know? Mm. And imagine the Brits, if they'd heard that a German plays James Bond. <laughs> oh, <laughs> anyway. Now, is that a role that you would have had had it worked out? Is that a role? Because you, you seem like you're very selective about the the work that you take. Is that a role that you would have done had it worked out and shaken out where you could have done it? Yeah. would have been it's easy. I mean, what's most difficult about that role? Nothing. You know? <laughs> a little physicality and, and, and easy. Yeah. There's nothing. Do the soap. Then you find out if you're an actor or not. Oh, my gosh. And there's so many people who, I mean, actors who have come from soaps who have done, you know, who've gone on like Tommy Lee Jones uh, was on Search for Tomorrow. Actors who said if you really want to get some work do the soap operas because that is oh a, a grind and like we said you've been at it for coming up on 40 years in february which is absolutely incredible so you must love it to work that hard and uh, and have been at it for this long i like to work hard and uh, i've never tired of it i'm very deeply grateful to be to be doing it again uh, people have to know the reality of hollywood uh, there are 150,000 registered actors registered with a Screen Actors Guild and after one percent, a thousand five hundred make a living. Yeah, you figure it out. Yeah, right? it's 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 a labor of love for so many people. I've got some friends that are out in L.A. who they they love doing it. They're extras on this set. They're doing that, but it's it's what they love. It's their passion, which is is good, especially if you're not making money at it. You need to love what you're doing. Right, right. So uh, so James Bond would have been easy. That's nothing. Well, you've also, you mentioned learning from James Cameron because you got to work with him and you've done producing. Uh, you worked with your son on a couple of movies. He's a, an acclaimed screenwriter and director in his own right, which has got to be very rewarding for you to uh, see him kind of not necessarily following your footsteps acting wise, but to kind of get his own area of the business and really kind of carve out a nice niche for himself. He went to UCLA film school and he has been making a living as a writer for quite some time. And he's a damn good writer, and he uh, wrote and produced uh, Den of Thieves, a film that was out about a year, a year and a half ago, I think. Den of Thieves with Gerard Butler and... and uh, Pablo Schreiber? Uh, uh, Pablo Schreiber was wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. 50 Cent, O'Shea Jackson, wonderful cast. And he wrote and directed that, and he's now um, finishing the sequel, and he's writing it, and he is doing another thing, uh, which he will start working on, that he wrote, will start working on um, soon, I think, early next year. 
etc. So he's doing very well. Uh, nothing makes me happier. I know it's, it's got to be a source of pride that he's doing so well. It's, it's uh, the collaboration. How many times has, has he come to you or you come to him and like, I'd love to work together. You, you've worked on some stuff together, but uh, is there that? Well, no, we, 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 uh, I, I respect his opinion a lot and, and I must say his opinion means more to me than, than anyone's opinion. And um, I read his stuff. You know, he sends me the early pages of whatever he's writing on and I'll give him my two cents worth. And uh, you worked on The Man Who Came Back, which uh, had a great cast as well. Billy Zane, uh, the great George Kennedy, uh, Sean right. Young, Carol Alt. So you got a lot of different hats of your own. With uh, You produced that one. Uh, you starred right. in it. That's got to be uh, behind the scenes stuff, I would think is more taxing than the acting part of it, but you you did so many roles in that, it had to be fulfilling when the final product was done. Yeah, well, to be honest with you, it was was, uh, some of the greatest fun I've ever had, I think, working on the film. Growing up, uh, talk a little bit about the origin story, if you will. Coming here... uh, Which story? Which story? Your origin story. Coming here from Germany, it's such a fascinating story. Your your dad was uh, the mayor. He he sadly passed, and I can relate to that. My dad passed away when I was very young as well. And it, mm-hmm. it does it does impact how your life uh, goes forward from there. Uh, oh boy, it doesn't ever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's it, but the resilience you've shown and coming here to America that's got to be as as we mentioned in the very very beginning part of this interview. It's the American dream. You came here with uh, fifty dollars in your pocket. New York City went to Galveston, up to Montana, uh, had mm-hmm. all this great adventure. It's got to be such an exciting time. What what do you remember most about uh, coming here, wanting to come here? I guess I should say. And we're going to pause it right there. More with Eric Braden as this hour continues. Stay with us. We'll be right back. As the world turns. Brought to you today by Oil of Olay. A lifetime of beautiful skin. Hi, this is Michelle Nichols. And you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. Welcome back to geek to me Radio. This segment brought to you by Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com, the website you'll want to go to to find what movies you want to see, where the closest Marcus location is to you, 11 different states, uh, plus new ones added now with Movie Tavern. So if you're going to a Movie Tavern and Marcus, uh, that will be the best place for you to see a movie. Uh, Jumanji 2 is coming out. Huge movie you can see over the holidays. The holidays are a great time to see movies. And the holidays make it a perfect time to give the gift of movies. You can give Marcus Theater gift cards to anybody. I mean, who doesn't like movies? If you don't like movies, I'm not sure what kind of person you are, quite frankly. Uh, But you can give the gift certificates, uh, the gift cards, so they can use them on concessions, use them on movies. It's a great gift idea. Stocking stuff. If you're trying to find something really quick, you can order them online. Or you can go to a Marcus Theaters location, get an actual physical gift card to slip in someone's stocking or to put in a Christmas card that you're sending out to people. Um, I know lots of people do gift cards for office employees. So, yeah, $5 office gift card for everyone in the office to Marcus Theaters. That's great. People, would, uh, they can use that to get some money off a ticket, especially if they go on a Tuesday. Then they're only going to pay a buck for a movie because they got those special deals going on Tuesdays for your Marcus Magic Rewards membership. And if you're not signed up for that, make sure you do. It rewards you for seeing movies. It couldn't be simpler. Go to MarcusTheaters.com. Check out the website. Learn all about the Magical Movies Reward Program and find out the closest theater to you. Go see a movie. Go to it in first class. Do it at a Marcus Theaters. MarcusTheaters.com. Before we went to break, we're talking with Eric Braden, as we are for the whole hour, asking him uh, what he remembers most about uh, coming here or wanting to come here as a, as a young person uh, back when he was 17 and 18, coming to America. You know, the, when I sometimes have memories of, of uh, before I came to America, uh, my generation, uh, I was born in 1941, so I essentially grew up and became conscious after the war. So uh, certain images of Americans that uh, I'd never forget, I mean, um, Clark Gable uh, films. Mm. Uh, my mother saw Gone with the Wind 13 times, I think. Uh, Gary Cooper. I mean, there are certain American icons that I, I will never forget, you know? And uh, Marlon Brando, uh, and, and I remember, and Julius Caesar. He played Ma- uh, Mark Anthony. And... Uh, and then Elvis Presley, and 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 very importantly, uh, 
Louis Satchmo Armstrong. He used to perform after the war. He and Lionel Hampton, for example, would perform up in my town in Kiel, northern Germany. Hmm. And uh, I will never forget Louis Armstrong. I love that guy. It's just, just amazing. And when he sang when the saints go marching in, my God almighty. I remember as a 12-year-old ruining my voice, you know, trying to imitate him. <laughs> and uh, there are certain things that are so American that, that it, it's hard to describe. You know, Europe is much more formal and formalized and all that. At least at that time it was. And that, that sort of casual American and yet strong and and and, and it, it, it Americans made an enormous impression on all of us after the war mm-hmm. no two ways about that and um, it it was culturally so different and yet similar enough to not be totally different you know I love the passage in your book you talk about uh, I think it was on your very first uh, movie role operation Eichmann where you didn't know that you had to know your lines and there was that woman who took you aside and worked with you during a pause while they reset some equipment and that's that woman, like you say in the book, you kind of owe your career to. She took you aside I, I, and worked with you. I do indeed. I do indeed. And I remember that very vividly. And she was a very sweet woman. And she knew that I was in trouble. And um, she came to help me. And without that, who knows what my career would have looked like. It's an amazing story because it's literally uh, that random stranger who totally changes your life that you don't even yep. expect. It's not someone you know. It's not someone you're familiar with, a, a relative or a friend. And I love that story. You talked about it so vividly, and it really kind of uh, it stayed with me, that particular image. I will never forget it, you know, because I had essentially no clue about filmmaking. I no idea. In Hollywood, I had no clue and, and uh, was never interested. And I was interested in sports and uh, acting sort of, kind of, yeah, interested me here and there. I must have had a, a, a penchant for it in, in, in high school because they always asked me to, to recite poetry and, and read aloud. And so um, something about that must have been within me. From sports, you learn how to perform. I was German uh, youth champion with my team in track and field, so it's it's uh, some of that I think was in me from early on, and because when I did it, I took to it like a duck to water, you know. And the sport stuck with you more, and it's almost kind of like acting was kind of like tugging you in that direction, though. That's it's it's very interesting that the the. the difference of you still preferred the sports but you have such fond memories of going to the movies and everything like that that's an interesting contrast yeah yeah but i'm i'm not i'm not a a, um, a film buff i really am not um i'm not and i'll tell you partly why it used to frustrate me enormously to, to go see good films when I saw Woody Allen films or Ingmar Bergman films or whatever, I wanted to be in it so badly, you have no idea. And I, uh, so I, I stopped going because it, it just was too frustrating very often. Um, that that happened actually quite a bit, where I would go and, and if I went to the theater to see a play or whatever, I would always envision how, how I would play that. How would I play this, 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 this? And when I, I mean, Woody Allen films, I used to love them. And, and Ingmar Bergman films, I loved and uh, Fellini films here and there, and uh, all American films. I mean, in, from, from Gone with the Wind to... I always envisioned how I would play it. Mm-hmm. So that was with me from early on. But that's why I have not become a movie buff, because it, it frustrates me too much. <laughs> I, I really... So everyone's got their favorite movie that no matter what, when it's on, like, I've seen it a million times, but if I'm flipping through the channels and something like Raiders of the Lost Ark or Mrs. Doubtfire is on... I'm going to stop what I'm doing and sit down and watch that movie. Do you have a movie or two like that that are just uh, always your favorites? Oh, my God. Uh, I would have to I'd have to think about that. I mean, on the waterfront, you know, with Marlon mm, Brando. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the Tennessee Williams story that he did, um, Stella, escapes me at the moment. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, um, one or two Woody Allen films that are my favorite uh, Ingmar Bergman films. Um, my God, there's so many. My God, there used to be an old French film called uh, Rififi with Jean Gabin. Well, I remember as a kid seeing that. That impressed me so much. And uh, Gone with the Wind, all the westerns, you know, with John Wayne and, and, yeah. and Gary Cooper and High Noon. And there are a lot of films that, that it's very funny. I have never had a very specific memory for those things. I just remember feelings. And then what, what always impressed me about performances were certain 
feelings you get. You know, it, it's hard to explain. No, I totally um, that. It, it, it just is, how do I explain that? Uh, what motivates me or what propels me are, when I want to do a part in a movie or Victor Newman, for example, are feelings. Do you understand? Sure. It's so hard to explain. There's some people who have perfect memory for, I never was interested in that. I was always interested in how does it impact me? How does it, how do I feel about it? Um, does that make any sense to you? It does, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a very visceral person. Uh, that's why I love sports so much. I need to feel it. I need to do it. Uh, let me put it that way. I think that, that expands it. I need to do something. I need to get my hands dirty. I need to do it. Observing it, yeah. But what then propels me after observing it is what impact it has left emotionally. Yeah, and those are the best performances, of course, that that resonate with you on an emotional level. If you if you end up exactly. feeling something, that's when you know the performance or the movie was was great. Is uh, when you when it resonates to your core and you it makes you laugh out loud uncontrollably, or you just cry uh, from. And a you have a you, you you in acting we call it a, a bullet meter. And that's, um, we'll, we'll pause right there. We'll come back and get Eric Braden's uh, take on what exactly a BS meter is and how it comes in handy. <laughs> Stand by. This is Ethan Phillips, the voice of Neelix, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We're back. Talking with Eric Braden this entire hour, uh, right before we went to break, he was telling us exactly what a BS meter is and how one can use such a thing. In other words, there's, there's, <laughs> there's, there's something in your head that says, no, this is a bad performance. Or when I give a performance... On a daily basis, sometimes you say, no, that was good. No, that wasn't good. And why wasn't it good? Because it wasn't real. For mm. me, it has to be real. Otherwise, it just, or approximate reality as much as possible. Otherwise, it, it, it means nothing to me. It, it's, it's phony. Uh, you can phone it in and it means nothing. It has to have some emotional reality and substance to it. That's why in politics, I can look at someone and say he's full of shit uh, or he's not. Some actors develop this bullshit meter. And uh, I've always had it. I've always had it. You see it in sports everywhere. It's it's either real or it's not. And in acting, especially. I mean, my God. That's why I'm such a huge fan of Mel Streep's. Mel Streep is just, she's magnificent. She's just, what she does is so real and so fantastic. It's it's almost unimaginable. It's just fantastic. Marlon Brando. Marlon didn't uh, ever give an unreal performance. It, it was always real. And that has always attracted me. When I see that in actors, um, you know, then I get drawn into a film. For example, right now there's on Netflix there's a series called Gomorra that my son made me aware of. It's an Italian series about uh, the mafia in Calabria and life around Naples, etc. It is arguably one of the best acted and directed things I've ever seen. It is so damn real. You sit there and say, are you serious? This is incredible. This is just extraordinary. And uh, that kind of stuff interests me. Hmm. Documentaries. Documentaries interest me. Love documentaries. Yeah, and there's so many good ones. It seems like the amount of documentaries that are being produced, maybe it's because of all the streaming platforms like Amazon and Hulu and Netflix, but right. there's so many outlets that you're able to access the documentaries more easily. I, maybe that's it, but I'm seeing, and there are so many more on my radar than I used to see before, and there's some fantastic ones out there. They're fascinating. Oh, God, yeah. Absolutely. Listen, life is so interesting, you know, and uh, so that's why... Um, Knowing as much as you can about history is so important. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I know we've been talking almost, almost for an hour. Um, you, you, cool. mentioned, you mentioned Brando, though. You got to work with him, which uh, not many people can claim. Uh, having been a fan of his, getting to work with him, that must have been a very surreal experience. Uh, it, it, yes, it was, kind of. Um, yeah. And uh, one of the most uh, charismatic people I think I've ever met in my life. And uh, he had an innate power, but a kind of power that I've noticed in about two or three other people in my life. Two others were boxers. And in other words, where you have the feeling they don't care what mm -hmm. you think or don't think. They speak the truth. And they, they express what they feel. And it is sometimes brutally honest. And uh, he had that kind of power. Now, he also was very defiant about a lot of aspects of working in Hollywood. And I think he, you know, wasted a lot of energy fighting certain things. And and uh, uh, one of the most gifted actors, period. George C. Scott was another one like that. Uh, uh, yes. Great actor. 
What's his name from from the French Connection? What's his name? Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman is a wonderful actor. Again, it's it's you know they they speak the truth, and and it's no bullshit. Those are the performers that I've always been impressed by, and. Um, Oh. You mentioned George C. Scott, and just because you've talked about performances and uh, how real some of them are, George C. Scott is the star of one of my all-time favorite horror movies from 1980 called The Changeling. Uh, just a riveting story. His performance is just spot on. It's uh, If you haven't had the chance to see it, I can't recommend it highly enough. But uh-huh. just, uh, again, I'm not sure if you're a horror fan, but as a, if you're a fan of George C. Scott, that's a movie that should be on your list for sure. Uh-huh. The Changeling? Yes, from 1980. I see. No, I remember him from Patton. Yes, oh yeah, My course. God Almighty. Yeah. yeah. That's got to be very hard that. to play a, and you've done it, you played John Jacob Astor, to play a historical character. That's almost, right. I would think, a little bit more intimidating than playing a character that's been written like a Victor Newman or like someone from, uh, you know, uh, the Rat Patrol and things like that. Right, 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 right. So that's, right. I guess, when the truth really has to come from your performance when you're playing a person who's a historical character, who's a real person. Well, you, 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 you find what you can in that character that resonates with you, and um, then you do the best you can, you know? It's, yeah. Important thing is to empathize emotionally and, and with a character and say, I understand why he did this or that. And um, anyway, that's a complicated process. Yeah. But yeah, but you mostly draw from within yourself. That's why you begin to realize and begin to recognize the universality of, of emotions, you know, regardless of where you're from. There's a certain universality in all of us where we, as human beings, react to certain things similarly. We have so much in common. I don't care where we are from, you know? Uh, with, uh, I, again, I won't keep you too much longer. Just a couple more questions. With all of the experience you've had, uh, like I said, your book, I'll Be Damned, which is a riveting read, all the experiences you've had, all the different adventures, is that part of what you think makes you such a good actor because of all the life experience you had and accumulated that you have to draw on these range of emotions and uh, things that have happened to you? Is that, I'm sure, a large part of what's made you a successful actor? And that is a very good question, and I think uh, the answer is affirmative. I think uh, the more you read and internalize things, you need to, uh, that's why the understanding of reading about historic characters, for example, and you need to internalize their experiences as much as you can. I think you need to read as much as you can to to open your horizons, you know? I mean, uh, I talk to some young people about certain experiences I've had, for example, or the, that are actually readily available in books and what have you, and they have no clue. They have no mm. idea. Imagine, for example, just imagine for a moment. I remember when I came to America in 1959 and driving through the South in a Greyhound bus, uh, 18 years old, and, you know, I thought, wow, I said, wait a minute. It says for whites only, for colors only, and that made such an impression on me. I thought, what is that all about? And uh, it, 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 it just opened me up to uh, the experience of African Americans in, in, in America. And, and then you begin to sort of, I, and Clarence Williams III, who played my stepbrother in the play I did on Broadway, uh, where Kurt Jürgens played our father, often told me, he says, man, you have no idea what it's like to be a black man. You know, every time I go somewhere, I'm reminded of it. And you begin to think about that. I say, whoa. And uh, then the other day they talked about busing, you know. And, and I remember in the 70s how many of us were not for it at the time because I then thought these poor kids are being picked up in the ghetto, being put into a bus full of diesel fumes and then driven at, at 5, 6, or 7 in the morning to God knows where. And But now, in retrospect, I think it was a wonderful thing. It was a very good thing. Mm-hmm. Because it otherwise, the ghettoization in America would have continued, would have become much worse. And now my son, for example, began to get to know uh, African Americans. And uh, that's why I took him down to the ghetto when he was eight, nine years old to box. We, we need to understand what we have in common as human beings, be it black, white, um, Asian, whatever. There was a thing on, 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 I think, on 60 Minutes about all the refugees, the Syrian refugees who live in camps and 115-degree heat in Jordan, for example. And you see all these little kids, man, they're like my grandkids. You need to open your eyes to the world and, yeah. and to, to other human beings. We have so much in common. All these artificial differences. I mean, the, the, the human experience is the same. And, and you need to open your heart to the experience of others. 
And uh, that is why the understanding of history and the reading of history is so vitally important. Um, my God, some of the some of the guy who taught me Henry Davis, who taught me how to box in the ghetto. What a sweet man! What a what a wise man! Full of street philosophy, but so wise. I just am drawn to people who have gone through experiences, yeah. who have gone through hardships. That is what makes them human beings to me. Others who simply skip around on the surface, that doesn't interest me. It makes does it make any sense? Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, absolutely. That bull meter comes in handy then because you can pick out the people who are just surface level. Yeah. And I mean, where, does, where, where, for example, does soul music come from? Soul music comes from the suffering of mostly the black population in America. I mean, the enormous suffering, mm-hmm. you know, been, been in slavery for, for hundreds of years. I mean, that's where that comes from. It's, it's, it's from the soul. You know, the other music that, that appears to me a great deal is Russian music. When you listen to Russian folk music, you realize they have suffered. Russians have suffered under one dictatorship after the other for centuries, you know? And, and people forget that. Russia has always been under one dictatorship after the other. Sure. And what happened under Stalin communism is, is almost unimaginable. So anyway, um, my life has taught me anything it is to is to not judge people that quickly you know it, it's try to understand them and um, my god uh, look at all the all the people who lost their jobs in the Midwest yeah you know because of globalization and because of no fault not anyone's fault really but it has a lot to do with globalization and and but look at look at that I remember I grew up with that money I know what it means when your mother doesn't know where the food is coming from, you know? Right. That that applies to everyone. I don't care of what cultural background they are. And just think back on that. And it's, it's, you have to feel empathy for that. And, uh, but not bullshit about solving the, solving the problems, but try to really do it. Exactly. And um, it's, it's, I mean, look at the, uh, Anthea Bourdain did some shows about Detroit and some of those, which has improved now, but uh, a lot of the cities in America that, that went through difficult times because of uh, the, you know, the deindustrialization, really, if you want, and the manufacturing base has been taken away. And uh, for reasons having nothing to do with one party or the other, it's just a fact, so we need to put our heads together and try to solve it. So my heart goes out to people who, who suffer. I've been there. Right. You know? yeah. And my last question, again, I'm very appreciative of your time this afternoon. As active as you've been and as much as you uh, are passionate about politics, has anyone ever approached you about running for any office, mayor, state senator? Has that ever even interested you? Well, I will piss off too many people because I speak my mind, you know? <laughs> and uh, now I'm... Mm, yes, I've been approached many times, but no. I refuse to talk in simple terms as either Republican or Democrat. And, and Forget it. As I said at the beginning of the show, let's look at problems carefully, realistically, and scientifically, and see how we can solve them. And not along ideological lines. Not interested in that. Couldn't care less. Yeah. Have I been approached? Yes, I have. Uh, will I do it? No. You've got enough uh, to keep you busy <laughs> with everything else without adding the politics. Yeah. It. So that's yeah. And then I mean, look, part of the difficulty of, of what's happening now. I mean, you get into that world. I mean, they attack you every which way, you know. And if someone uh, during a debate or whatever uh, said certain things to me, I'd say, "Come here, you and I go behind the house. Let's go." <laughs> okay, I knock the shit out of you. It wouldn't end well for but them if that happened. I guess if you insult me like that, are <laughs> yeah, you kidding me? Absolutely. In a man's world, you say, "What did you say?" Come here, let's go. Uh, they, they. I mean, look, uh, it, I'm not PC. Let's put it that way. Okay, <laughs> that's, right? that's that's perfect. Um, again, uh, very appreciative of your time. It's been uh, fascinating to talk to you, I, and I recommend the book for anyone listening. I'll be damned. Uh, you can still get it on Amazon. We'll put the link up. Uh, Eric Braden, uh, continued success. Happy upcoming 40th anniversary of your time on Young and the Restless. Before you finish, let me let me tell sure. you who had enormous influence on me and my relationship to my fans. That is number one, Muhammad Ali, and number two, Pele, the soccer player. I knew both of them. And their relationship with fans so impressed me. It was always so genuine and so nice. It, it really left an indelible uh, um, mark on my, my brain. And they were a perfect example of how you should deal with fans. And um, uh, Mom Ali was gracious and funny and warm, and so was Pele. 
and those two impressed me a great deal. Anyway, enough said. Have a great time, and uh, go be with your dog now, <laughs> and calm him down. Uh, he'll get and some peanut you, butter. And thank, thank you for having me. Oh, I like peanut butter, too. Perfect. Come on over. <laughs> peanut, peanut, peanut butter and honey. Oh, Ooh, no, there you no. go. A nice piece of fresh bread. Oh my now, God! You're talking what I ate in college, right there, peanut butter. My, and honey my, bread. my wife, my wife introduced me to that. Oh really? We we didn't have that in Germany growing up. We didn't know anything about peanut butter. I learned it here. I love it. I love it. See, I took anyway. a trip to Germany when I was uh, in high school, and I didn't know about Nutella. And now I make Nutella and peanut butter sandwiches, and that's uh, it was introduced to me in Germany for the first time. Which one? Nutella. It's like that hazelnut spread. It's oh, right, right. That, that, that was that, never here that, before. That, that that came later. That, yeah. that came later. That that wasn't during my time. But when I came here and my wife introduced me to peanut butter Sam. I said, ooh, that's good. Love that. <laughs> yeah, I love my time in Germany. I spent a month there uh, my senior year of high school, and it was just, people are so warm and friendly, and I absolutely loved my time there. Yeah, you got you got to get to know Germans, and they're warm and friendly once you get to know them. At yeah. first, sort of standoffish, but you got to get to know them, and uh, a beautiful country. It was indeed, yeah. All right, man. Be cool. You too. Thank you so much. And that's going to do it. Um, huge thanks to Eric Braden for taking the time to be on air with us. We love discussing all of this stuff. If you've not read that book, we're going to have a link to where you can buy I'll Be Damned, the Eric Braden story, in the podcast notes when this goes up online. So make sure you click on that. Uh, it's a riveting read. I blew through it in just a few days. Uh, you will enjoy it as well. Thanks again to our sponsors, Discover St. Charles and Marcus Theaters. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and Instagram at geek me Radio. We've got much, much, much more to come before the year ends. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound be. It's not in the way you watch the flash. It's not in Thank you, Genoa City. Good night.